Well, good morning. Good to see you guys with us today. So glad uh, we get to dive back into Proverbs 27. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and open that up and let's uh, dive in there and see what the Lord has for us this morning. If you were with us last week, you know that we looked at verse 12. And, um, well, let's just review it because I know half of y'all probably don't remember what we talked about, even if you were here. And uh, the other half of you may not have been here. So let's uh, just go back and kind of quickly recap last week because we're building on last week for this week. So last week we said uh, that the prudent path or the prudent person does two things. The first is they have the ability to see or perceive. They can see what's happening uh, around them. They can perceive when there's danger approaching. Uh, We said last week that the wise man does at the beginning what a fool only does at the end because, again, the wise or the prudent have eyes to see. We said, secondly, that the wise man or the prudent man or woman uh, has the ability to pivot. When needed, they can change course or change direction. They, They don't just see what's about to happen, but they see it, and then they do something about it. That's where we're going to pick up. So not only do they change course or direction, today uh, we're going to continue there in verse 12, and we're going to talk about the reality that we need to protect some things in our life. There need to be some areas of our life that we shelter and protect. Here's what our verse says. The prudent sees danger and he hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The prudent sees danger and hides himself. That word there for hides, it means to cover up. It means to protect. It means to shelter and and protect yourself from whatever is coming your way. Last week, our big idea was that we need to seek the prudent path, or the other option is we're going to walk a painful path. And that continues to be our big idea for today as we continue in this text. If we don't protect some important things in our life, it's going to be painful. Amen? If we don't protect the fragile things in our life, it's going to hurt when they get hit or bumped or stuck or stabbed. It's going to hurt. And so we have got to protect those things. So today I'm going to give you a list of four things that I've decided in my life, if I'm going to be prudent, I've got to protect these things. And I I just want to tell you here right at the beginning... I don't want you just by default to make this list your list. I mean, I think it's a good list because I made it, but, um, but it doesn't have to be your list. I think it probably should, but, but I don't want you just by default to make it your list. I really want you and your spouse to wrestle with this idea or this concept more than just to take what I'm going to tell you and try to make that yours by default. And the reason I want you to wrestle with it and the reason I want you to think about it is because I really want you to process the concept here uh, around what God is saying and around the importance of being prudent more than just saying, oh, here's another list of check boxes. If I do these four things, my life is, is going to be better or my life is going to be great. I believe it would be, but, but I, I believe that that's only really going to work if you take the time to process it. Let me also say that I have a list longer than four I just don't have enough time in today's sermon to give you the rest of the list, okay? So your list should be longer than four as well, and I'm trusting that you have enough spiritual maturity to continue the process after we're done here today and identify the most important areas of your life that you as a prudent man or a prudent woman need to protect. So let's talk, point number one, the prudent protect. Let's talk in general about this concept or this idea that if you're a prudent person, you're going to protect the most important areas of your life. The writer said, the prudent sees danger and he hides himself. The prudent seek a prudent path. Those who don't walk a painful path. I love what Proverbs 14, verses 15 through 18 says. It says it in kind of a different way, but says the same thing. It says, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. He's looking at the path that he or she is walking on. He's thinking about it and considering it. One who is wise, verse 16 says, is cautious and turns away from evil. 
But a fool is reckless and careless. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. You see, to be considered a prudent person, you must be someone who knows how and what you need to protect. There are things in your life, in my life, that we need to protect. And if you think about it, this, this even works in our natural world. It works in, in, with our bodies, for example. There are a lot of things we protect that are fragile on our bodies, and we just do it by impulse. We do it by instinct, right? Because it's the prudent thing to do. For example, if there's a baseball flying at your face, what do you do? Do you just stand there and smile and take it? No. The first thing your body's going to do is close your eyes. Not, and, and that's not so you can't see it coming, because that won't fix the problem, will it? But your body knows that your eyes are very fragile, and your body knows that eye needs to be protected. And so it's going to squint and suck them into your head and try to keep those things protected. And then, instinctually, without even thinking about it, you're going to duck or move your head opposite the direction the ball is traveling. You're going to try to get out of the way of it. If you have enough time, you might do one of these and get your hands up, right? That would be the prudent thing to do. You do it instinctually. If you've ever been out there weed eating, I know at my house nobody wants to weed eat. People don't mind so much mowing, but they sure don't want to weed eat. But if you've ever gone out to weed eat and, um, you know, you weren't a prudent person, you didn't put on your safety goggles. I know none of y'all have never done that. But you went out and you got started weed eating and everything was going good. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you see something flying to your face. Without even thinking about it, what do you do? You close your eyes. And hopefully you do it in time. Because if you don't, you can lose an eye. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I know I have. Ooh, that was close. I better go get those safety goggles. I better go put that on because that that could have been really, really bad, right? But you instinctually say, I'm going to protect this because it's fragile. If you've ever been in a fight, you don't fight like this with your hands down. What do you do? You get your hands up because this part of your body is vulnerable and it's sensitive. And you don't want to get hit in the head, and so you're trying to be ready not only to attack, but also to defend the most vulnerable part of your body. You can take some blows down here, especially if you're big like me, but you don't want to be taking them up on your head or in your nose or your teeth. It's a good way to lose. It's a good way to be defeated. So you protect those most vulnerable parts of your body. If you've ever been swimming, here's another good example. If you've ever been swimming and you swallowed a little bit of water and it went down the wrong pipe and it got into your lungs and you started hacking and feeling like you were about to drown, what did your body automatically do? It started kicking and it started paddling and it started heading to the shallow end where you could stand up or the side where you could hold on, right? Or back to the boat if you were out in open water. You instinctually knew, I got to keep my head above water because right now I need oxygen. And if I don't get oxygen, that's not going to be good. Your instincts kick in and you naturally go to protect those things that are vulnerable. It can be hard to protect everything, but we have to protect something, right? You can't protect everything, but you've got to protect those things that are most vulnerable in those situations. Here's my fear, church, and here's what I see a lot of people doing. They wait until the stick is flying at their eye to close their eyes or to go get a pair of goggles. They wait until they're they're drowning before they say, you know what, maybe maybe we ought to go to the shallow end for a bit or maybe we ought to hold on to the edge or maybe we ought to start kicking. See, a prudent person understands that it's better to go ahead and head this off at the pass than to have to deal with it after it's happening in our life. And that's the process I want you and your spouse to go through this week and chew on these things and say, let's make a list of the things we need to protect, the things we need to be disciplined about, the things we are going to identify as sensitive, fragile, important areas of our life that need to be protected. And can I just tell you, you can't protect everything. If you make your list 20, 30, 40 things long, you'll never protect it all. 
You're going to have to identify the top five to ten things in your life and say, you know what, no matter what, we're protecting these. We're standing on these. These are going to be essentially what they are, is they're your priorities. These are my priorities, and I want you to put them in order. From greatest importance to least importance. What's that thing you're going to protect no matter what? That goes in the number one spot. Let me give you my list, and these are in order, okay? Number one, first thing, most important thing. The thing I'm going to protect no matter what is my spiritual life. It's my walk with God. No matter what, that is going at the top of the list. And all of these categories are going to be big, broad categories. I'm just going to tell you right now, there's a lot of stuff inside of that title or that topic, that heading, spiritual life, right? But here's the reality. If I fall out of step with the Lord, that literally affects every other area of my life. It affects my relationships. It, it affects my ability to do my job as a, my professional life. It affects my finances. It affects my emotional well-being. It affects my physical well-being. It affects everything. When I fall out of step with the Lord, everything else falls out of step. And so to me, that is the most sensitive, fragile, important thing that I'm saying is number one at the top of my list. I've got to protect that. That means I've got to protect my prayer time. That means I've got to protect my Bible reading time. That means when I come to the Bible, I can't just come to the Bible looking for my next sermon. I'm coming to the Bible looking for Jesus and the Holy Spirit and what does it need to speak to my life. I've got to protect that because it's real easy when you're a preacher to just come and read it for content, material, right? But you've got to read it for yourself. Before I'm a pastor, I'm a disciple, before I'm a father, I'm a disciple. If I'm not a disciple first, the rest of it falls apart. So I've got to protect that. I've got to protect my study time. I've got to protect the times that I'm going to come together with other people and dive in and dig in deep. I've got to live right in the eyes of the Lord. I've got to be able to go to sleep at night knowing that I've done what God has called me to do. More than anything else, I need to be in step with God, in step with Jesus, and just full of the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you something, church? That does not happen without intentionality. It doesn't happen without commitment. I've been following the Lord now for 30 plus years. And I can tell you still to this day, I've got to intentionally protect this area of my life. Why? Because the devil wants to destroy this. He knows if he can get me to fall here, everything else falls because this touches everything in my life. And it doesn't just touch what's here and now in front of me on earth. It, it touches eternity too. And so he wants to destroy this and attack this. So I have to have the mindset of, I'm going to protect this. I reflect often on Psalms 37, 23. I love this truth. It says, a person's steps are established by the Lord. I want my steps to be established by the Lord. And he takes pleasure in his way. Though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed because the Lord supports him with his hand. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. He is always generous, always lending, and his children are a blessing. I want to make sure that my steps and my days are established by the Lord. But I've got to protect that. When I get in my quiet time, I turn my phone off. I have to. Because if I don't, I guarantee you, the first thing that will happen, as soon as I hit something that kind of pokes me or prods me or challenges me, that thing's going to ding, beat, vibrate, buzz. A little demon will pop out of it and put a little hologram. I mean, something's going to happen. If I don't turn that distraction off, it's going to pull me away. I've got to protect that time. If I don't, it won't happen. And that goes for every other area of my spiritual life. For the sake of time, I'm not going to give you examples for everything, but it's just the way it is. Proverbs 16, 7, when a person's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. I wanted to share this verse with you because I want you to see, you know, he's talking here about enemies, but he's saying when you're right with God... Even your enemies get at peace with you. Because that's the thing. This trickles down into everything else in your life. That's why I say, I, I think this should be at the top of your list. 
I think this ought to be on, on all of our lists, and it ought to be something we protect no matter what. We're going to spend time with God in his word, memorizing scripture, um, you know, reading scripture with other people, by ourselves, praying, doing all those things, because it literally touches everything else, even our enemies. It seeps down and trickles through the rest of our life. So we have to protect it. But to protect it, we're going to have to battle against the devil. And we're going to have to battle against our own flesh. To live in step with God, to walk his paths, we're going to have to protect it, battling against the devil and battling against our flesh. Romans 8.8, 8, those who are in the flesh says, cannot please God. If we don't beat that sucker back every day... <laughs> Oh, he'll catch up to us real fast. It doesn't take a whole long time or a whole lot of unintentionality to drift far from the intentionality you once promised the Lord you would have in your life. And church, we cannot please God if we're living in the flesh. We have to be walking and living in the Spirit. And that's not going to happen if we don't protect it. This is something the prudent protect. They guard. They give their attention to and I know this to be true because this is the thing Jesus protected. He was always about God's business. He always protected his relationship with his father. He always protected his time with the father. He would leave the masses waiting to be healed or waiting to see another miracle or just waiting to hear him preach. And he would just disappear into the mountains to be with God. He knew his business was to please the father. And we need to know that's our business too. John 8, 29 says, and this is Jesus, he says, the one who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Do you? Do I? Of course not. I've got some room. I can work on this. I don't know about you, though, but this is the way I want to live. I want to live like Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I want to please the Father. But if I'm going to do that, I've got to make it a priority. It's got to be at the top of my list, and I have to protect it. So I do my best to protect this, and I hope you will too. Again, this is a big, broad area. All of these are big, broad areas. My spiritual walk with the Lord is going to govern my morality, my integrity, my character. It's going to govern my generosity. It's going to govern govern my spiritual disciplines, as I've already mentioned, many of those. It's going to govern what I do with my time. It's going to even govern how I rest. You know, the Lord said, work for six, rest for one. How many of us are doing that? It's going to govern a lot in our lives when we get in step with him and when we fall into rhythm with him. But I'm telling you, if you don't protect it, it'll get away from you. And if you don't seek the prudent path, you will walk a painful path. Number two, second thing on my list, is relationships or relational. It's another huge category. It's one that requires great attention and effort, one that requires great discipline to protect. And this is a very sensitive area. It's a very vulnerable area. It's an area I know the enemy wants to attack. And if I don't protect it, he will destroy it. So what would be included in this area of my life? Well, obviously my marriage my kids, my parents, the people I work with and serve with here at our church, my friends, my neighbors, all of you are going to be in this because even though we may not be best friends, we have a relationship. It even includes my enemies, people who don't like me. And I know some of y'all are thinking, there's somebody who doesn't like you? Oh my goodness. I'm glad y'all get the sarcasm. But of course, we all have people we don't get along with for one reason or another, or we've gotten cross with for one reason or another. But you know what? I still have a relationship with them. may not be a good one, but it's a relationship, and I've got to do my part to protect it. I love what Paul says in Romans 12, 17, and 18. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. He says, give careful thought... Consider your path, consider what you're doing, give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And then he says this in verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, you do your part to make the relationship as best it can be. 
Give careful thought. Give careful attention. Intentionality. Watch your steps when it comes to your relationship. Pay attention. Protect this area of your life. Do what the prudent person does. Because if you don't seek the prudent path with your relationships, guess what path you're going to walk? The painful path. That's right. Now some of you might want to put this at the top of your list. I get it. It's, it's a strong temptation. But I would encourage you not to. Because when you really think about it, if you start putting people above God, that creates a lot of problems in your life, doesn't it? And we know it does because we see it all the time. I know, you know, we want to say God's my number one priority. I'm, I'm trying to please God. I'm protecting that. I'm doing what God wants me to do. We say that a lot with our mouths, but then our actions tend to say people are more important to God than, than, than to me than God really is. Many people put people above God. You can say God's first in your life all day long, but if your actions don't prove it, I mean, it's not hard to see that he's not. Let me give you an example of why this is dangerous. Why it's dangerous to put people above God. And this is just one example. Again, we could give many. We just don't have time. But I promise you this. If you start putting people above God, there's going to come a point or a time in your life when you're going to have to make a decision. And you're going you're to make a choice to do something to someone you don't like so that you can help someone or bless someone that you do like. And that may not be what God wants you to do. But because you put people above God, you're going to do what helps you, what makes you look good, what helps somebody that can help you, or what will bless somebody that can bless you, rather than doing what God has called you to do. And that's just one of a thousand, ten thousand, a million different traps we can fall into if we make people the priority above God. Even our children, even our spouses. If, If we prioritize them over God, It affects how we see things, how we make decisions. It affects everything, which is why I say God has to be at the top. The result of getting your priorities out of line, the result of even just swapping two like this, can really produce a lot of problems in your life, which is why our spiritual life must always be at the top. But there's no doubt about it. God created you and I to live in relationship, didn't he? Two primary relationships God created you for. First, a relationship with him, which again is why he should be at the top of the list. He created Adam in the garden to have a relationship with him. God created man to live in relationship with him. Now we know that all got torn apart, all went out the window. When sin happened, invaded our world, we're still suffering because of that today. But if you go back to the beginning, you'll see God created Adam to live in relationship with him. And then God quickly saw that it wasn't good for the man to be alone. Do you remember Genesis chapter 2 verse 18? It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. And then here comes Eve. The first relationship between humans is formed. But that relationship is a fragile thing, isn't it? In fact, you don't have to go far in the scripture to find Adam and Eve pointing fingers at each other, blaming each other, arguing with each other. You don't have to go far to find them ashamed and covering each other themselves so the other can't see. You don't have to go far to find, you know, um, relationships breaking down in Scripture. Again, we could give many examples, but we just don't have time. You see, the bottom line is a prudent person is going to invest and protect their relationship with God first and their relationship with others second. Because that's what God created us to live in, relationship. John 15, 12 says, this is my command, this is Jesus. Notice he doesn't say this is my suggestion. (laughs) He doesn't say this is my good idea. Church, when Jesus says this is my command, it's probably something we ought to pay attention to. He says, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. Protect your relationships. There are many more verses in the Bible about loving one another and protecting our relationships. We don't have time for them today. But can I just say this? 
I really, really believe the world could use a whole lot more of people loving one another. How different would our world and our churches be if we just did a whole lot more of this? See, prudent people walk a path of building strong, godly relationships both inside and outside of their families and their homes. In church, if you don't protect this, it leads to pain. So seek the prudent path or you will walk a painful path. Next, third thing on my list is my physical life. To me, this is less important than my relationship with God or my relationship with other people, but it is important and it matters. And and I'm going to be honest with you guys today. If I'm honest, this is an area of my life I've really got to work on. Out of everything I'm going to talk to you about today, this is the one I struggle with the most. There have been seasons in my life when I have done really, really good at this. And then there have been a lot of long seasons in my life when I haven't. And I'm in one of those seasons right now where I'm not doing a good job here. And I need to do better. I'm not protecting this area of my life. Now, I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke cigarettes, I don't, I don't do drugs. Um, you know, those are some, some good things, helps protect your, your health. Abby cooks pretty healthy, I'm blessed in that. My wife is a great cook, and uh, she's a very healthy person. This is a thing on, on our list, but really it's a thing on her list. She thinks about it all the time. Like, when we go out to eat, y'all, I'm telling you, if Abby gets a Coke, we're all like, whoa. Like, maybe once or twice a year she has a soda. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. She cooks really healthy. You know, we garden, we do stuff. But that, that's mostly because she's doing it. I like vegetables. I don't mind eating them, you know? I don't despise them. But these are like baseline stuff, right? It's just stuff that everybody should do. But the reality is, is I, I consume way too much sugar. Way too much. I have a bad, bad sweet tooth. <laughs> like... I mean, donuts, cheesecake, soda water, anything with sugar in it, I want it. I don't exercise nearly enough. I know that's a surprise to y'all. Y'all are looking at me. Like, (laughs) what? You? You? My goodness. I thought you were at the gym every day, Pete. But I'm just confessing here, I don't. I have. There have been seasons in my life when I've done good here. But I'm just not in that season right now. I've been doing really bad. I work way too much. I carry way too much stress. More stress than, than it's healthy to carry, for sure. And I know it. But all that just means is I'm not protecting this area of my life right now very good at all. I know I should, but I don't do it. And I'm looking at y'all, and I can tell y'all aren't either. So all y'all who are laughing at me, go home and look in the mirror. 80% of y'all in the same boat I'm in, if not 90, right? But I often, and maybe you feel this way this part of your life, um, I often feel like, like the Apostle Paul. He said in Romans 7, 15, For I do not understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law. He's, he's talking about spiritual stuff here, not eating right or physical, but that's, the, that's what I struggle with, right? Like, I know what I need to do, but I can't. Like, isn't it ironic? And, and I was thinking about this just the other day. It's like, I'm finally at a point in my life when I can afford good food, and now the doctor tells me I can't eat any of it. You know, like, I don't have to eat ramen anymore. I, we, we, can, we, we don't have to have spaghetti four times a week. And now the doctor's like, oh, you can't eat none of that stuff. But well, isn't that how life goes? But if I don't protect it, what's going to happen? If you don't walk the prudent path, what path do you walk? Painful path. That's right. That's the same with your physical life. It's the same with my physical life. I don't think any of us are going to live forever, but I do think our physical bodies are important. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about our bodies being the temple of God. And he's right. God lives inside of us through the Holy Spirit. God works through us. We're his hands and his feet. And if we neglect to take care of the vessel that the Lord has given us, 
to accomplish his work and his mission, it won't be long before we're not able to do what he's called us to do. It's a very vulnerable area of our lives, our physical bodies. And I don't know if y'all have noticed or not, but you've only got one. And it's wonderfully designed. It's, a, it's an amazing machine, but it's not going to last forever. But we also shouldn't be destroying it quicker than we should, right? I read a really good health book a number of years ago when I was in one of those good seasons in my life and I was doing good here. It's a book called How Not to Die by a guy by the name of Michael Greger. Funny title. And when I saw the title, I thought, well, yeah, but everybody dies, Michael. And he addresses that at one point in his book and he says something like this. This isn't an exact quote, but he, he said in his book, he says, I know I'm going to die one day. I just don't want it to be my fault. And I thought, you know what? That's right. And, and what he goes on to say in his book is most people are just killing themselves slowly because of the way they eat, the fact that they don't exercise, the fact that they don't make their physical bodies a priority. And, and he lays out all the statistics in his book beautifully, and he talks about how many people die that really don't have to, at least not as early as they do. Everybody dies. See, the prudent protect their bodies and their physical well-being. Seek the prudent path or you'll walk a painful path. Here's the final one for me, for today, for you. That's the last one I'm going to share. Um, it's financial. Financial. Listen, I, I know everyone approaches finances and money differently. I also know that money is not the most important thing in the world or the most important thing in life. That's why it's down the list here. And, and it may be higher, you know, number four may have it way higher than you would put it on your list. I, I don't know. But for me, this ties together with all the other things that I've just talked about. And, and it's an extension of what God, is, I believe, wants to do with my life. And so it has to be up here in number four, in my opinion, for me. So obviously for me, my spiritual walk is first. My relationships are second. My physical health needs to be third, although it hasn't been lately. And financially, I, I, I need to be protecting that, number four, if I'm putting them in order. Can I just say, when it comes to money, your motives matter. And you need to have the right motives wherever you put finances on your list. And Abby and I, we discuss this. We talk about it all the time. How much is too much? How much is enough? What can we do to further God's kingdom with this? See, I, I don't, I don't want to have money. Abby doesn't want to have money. So so, um, so I can have a nice truck, obviously, right? Y'all seen what I drive. That old 05, I talk about it all the time, almost 350,000 miles on it. Like, I'm not a truck guy. I don't have to have a new truck to feel important or, or to feel like I'm somebody. I just don't. It's not a big thing to me. I, I don't want to have money so I can drive nice vehicles. I, I don't want to have money so I can have a beach house. I don't have a beach house or a river house. I don't think I ever will unless one of y'all want to give me one. Um, <laughs> I'm just probably never going to spend money on that. Like, it's, it's just not a thing for me. I'll rent one when I want to go there, but I'm not going to own one. I, I don't want to put this as number four and protect it because I want to be a millionaire. So I can say, whoo, -hoo, I'm a millionaire. But those aren't my motives when it comes to finances or money. My motive is that I want to be the best possible steward of God's resources that I can be. That's my motive. That's why this is number four. Because I know that the Bible calls me to be a steward. I know that every good gift is from God. I know that every blessing in my life is from him. And I want to steward every part of that as well as I can. And I know if I don't protect that, the devil will come in and he will hijack it. He will sabotage it and I'll waste stuff that God wanted me to use for his glory. So I know this is an area I can't just let go. It's, I know it's an area I can't just not think about because the devil wants to get into this area and derail it because it touches everything. I know it's a sensitive and vulnerable area, so I know I need to protect it. The Bible talks a lot about money. Proverbs 22.7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. I've been the borrower, and I've been the slave. They're one and the same. I've been a slave to the lender. I don't ever want to do that again. Like, I've told you guys many, many, many years ago, Abby and I decided we were getting out of debt. We did the Dave Ramsey thing. 
We got out of debt. It, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't take us a couple months. It took us years. We had a lot of debt. But we did it. And you know what? We have never once regretted that decision. We sacrificed and we saved and we scraped and, and we budgeted and we worked. And we have never once regretted all of that. Not once have we been sitting on the back porch sipping our tea, watching the sun go down and go, you know what I really miss? Those credit card bills. Golly. <laughs> Whoo. Yeah, but I miss those student loans even more. <laughs> Wish we got that, that letter every, week, every month, you know. We've, we've never, ever regretted that decision to work hard to get out of debt. Because we've seen the blessings that have come from getting control of this area of our life. Protecting this area also means that we do things like practicing generosity, right? It's, it's not just about getting rid of your debt. It's not just about having money in the bank. You also need to be generous with what you've got. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. The point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. I have never yet once in my life outgiven the Lord. He commands me to bring a tithe, a full tenth, into his kingdom through his storehouse, which is, in our context, the church. Abby and I have cheerfully chosen to exceed the command for 10% of our income for our entire marriage. We, we chose on day one, I won't tell you all what we give now, but, but day one of our marriage, we said, you know what? If God said 10%, let's test him and do 11. And even while we were trying to get out of debt, we kept increasing our generosity as we could. And we've continually increased that throughout our marriage. Because we believe there's nothing better we can invest in than the kingdom of God. I don't think it's wrong to invest in the stock market, but man, I, I want to invest in the kingdom of God. People come to us sometimes and ask for donations for things and whatnot. And, you know, they're good things. I'm not saying they're bad things at all. But we're investing in the kingdom of God. I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in other stuff if God tells you to. I'm not saying we haven't or we won't. I'm just saying, like, we prioritize this and we look at it and we go, you know what? We're putting what we have into the kingdom of God because that's what's going to last. I really do believe we as a couple have walked a prudent path in regard to generosity and wealth. And church, I'm just telling you, we found this path to be overflowing with God's blessings. It hadn't always been easy, but it's been so good. And those who are on the prudent path with their finances also, and I'm going to close this point with this, they learn to be content. I told the first service this, um, the path here is paved with contentment. I love what Paul tells Timothy. It's a good perspective. 1 Timothy 6, 7, and 8. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. He says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Those are prudent words from a prudent man. And they apply to you and I no matter how much you have or don't have. Here's the perspective. If you have $100, $100 in the bank right now, you can find contentment in the Lord and you can be blessed right there where you're at. The opposite of that, or the other side of that is this. You can have $100 million in the bank right now. And if you're not content, you'll be miserable and poor your whole life. Because the path here is paved with contentment. The path of prudence when it comes to finances is paved with contentment. So let me encourage you to protect this area. Be content where you're at. Strive to do better. Strive to, to give more. Strive to get a hold of your finances better. Strive to get your spending under control. I mean, I'm not saying those are bad things, but really and truly at the heart of it, you've got to learn to be content with where you're at and with what the Lord has given you. And then say as a steward, how do I do what is best with this? And I'm telling you, just like all these others, if you don't seek the prudent path with your finances, 
because this is such a sensitive, sensitive and vulnerable area of life, you will walk a painful path, won't you? Many of us have walked that one. I know I have. Remember what our text said? The prudent sees danger and hides himself, covers it, protects it. But the simple, they go on and suffer for it. As we close today, I want to encourage you one more time. Go home and think about this. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Go home and have some conversations with your spouse. Hey, what is it we need to protect? Let's make a list. Let's work on this. Let's brainstorm it. Let's come back to it again on Tuesday or Wednesday. Let's, let's, let's really make a game plan here and say these are the things we're going to protect. Make your list of four, five, six, seven, eight things. Again, not 20. You won't be able to protect them all. But find those things that are most important, put them on a list, and be a prudent person in regards to them. I don't want to close without saying this. None of these things are possible And none of these things even matter without Jesus being the Lord of your life. Your spiritual life should be at the top of the list. Again, I want to say that because anything you're going to protect on this planet or even in eternity is going to be linked to that. It affects everything. Not just here on earth, but also for eternity. So don't neglect Jesus. Don't turn away from him. Don't continue to carry your sin. He's offered you forgiveness. He offers to wash you clean, to make you new, to forgive you of your sins if you will believe and confess. And I pray that if you've never done that, that you will do the prudent thing, which is to call on him. Make him the Lord of your life because no matter how hard you try, nothing else is going to fall into place until you get that piece right. Let's pray. If you're here today and have never given your life to the Lord, I want to invite you to pray with me this morning. Just say these words. We're not going to ask you to come down the aisle or raise a hand. Just pray with me. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I pray that you would make me new, that you would make me whole. I thank you for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for meeting me here today and making me new. Father, as we close this hour, we are grateful for your patience and our lack of prudence. Lord, I'm grateful. that you have given us so much instruction in the word of God for how to live a life that is not only pleasing to you but is also a blessing to us and others. Lord, I pray we would chew on these things. I pray we would consider these things. I pray, Father, that we would not leave this time or this place without at least making a commitment to come back and visit this topic again before we gather again Lord help us to be people who seek and walk and long for the path of prudence instead of the path of pain Lord we thank you for dying on a cross for our sins to make a path for us to heaven for taking the path of pain so that we could be saved Thank you for suffering for us. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for this time we've had in your word. And we ask now that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.